Uh, good afternoon to you all. My name is Nkanyi Sokumete, I'm a researcher at PLUS. Today we are looking at the traditional court spill. We are looking at whether if it is passed into law, it will ensure access to justice for people in the former homelands and whether it is necessary. The first version of the bill was introduced in 2003 and 18 years later, there are still contentions on its contents. Uh, today, we will have the opportunity to look at the history of the bill and its intended aims. We'll also look at the current version of the bill and explore what is at the heart of the contestation. We'll then uh, get a reflection on the potential impact of the bill and look at what should happen moving forward. After that, we will then go to you, the audience, for questions and comments. For those of you on Twitter, our hashtag is traditional court spill. For this webinar, I am joined by two guests. Uh, the first one is Nolun Dilwaya, who is the director at LAC at the University of Cape Town. The second speaker is Koni Mohale, who's the national coordinator of the Alliance for Rural Democracy. Later on, we are going to be joined by our third guest, which is Me Molomo from a village uh, in Limbombo. Welcome to you all, my guests. So what I will do now, I will start with you, Nolundi. Can you please take us through the history of the bill and why it was developed, and then take us through the contents of the current version of the bill? Uh, over to you, uh, Nolundi. Thanks, Nganyiso, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to be part of this webinar. Um, as you've pointed out, the traditional courts bill came about in 2003 um, when the South African Law Reform Commission created a draft version of the bill. That version of the bill uh, was not well received and, and was rejected. And, and in 2008, um, we saw a version emerging uh, from the Department of Justice um, that was quite a, a problematic version of the traditional courts bill. It centralized power in the role of the traditional um, and made it uh, a place for people uh, to opt out of the traditional court. Um, we then, uh, you know, there were objections launched uh, against that 2008 version, particularly uh, from women's groups who felt that the bill did not offer them adequate protection. And in 2012, uh, the same version of the bill was reintroduced into Parliament. Um, and in that process, uh, we saw a very, very active participation uh, from rural communities, which I think Ask Connie will speak about. Um, and rural communities really making it clear that this was not the, uh, the bill that they need, nor was it the bill that they felt um, aligns with customary law and how traditional courts operate in practice. And so in 2014, the bill lapsed. Um, and in the years between uh, the Department of Justice instituted a process of a reference group that involved members from civil society organizations, traditional leaders, um, and other stakeholders. And from that reference group process emerged a bill uh, that we saw in 2017, which was a much better version of the traditional courts bill. Uh, it was a version that indicated the processes of compromise that the reference group had worked so hard for. And it was a version that uh, provided an opportunity for people to opt out of the bill uh, and provided a process for that to be exercised. It also gave much better um, protections and recognition to the experiences of women. Um, and it also was a version of the bill that really acknowledged the voluntary and consensual nature of customary law. That 2017 version then went back to the Portfolio Committee in the National Assembly. And over the years of 2017 and 2018, the Portfolio Committee made some very drastic amendments to that version of the bill. Um, and under the chair of, uh, uh, then chair of the Portfolio Committee, Dr. Matole Mochecha, the bill was altered quite significantly. And a lot of the compromises and useful advances that the reference group had developed were actually removed. And so the bill was um, amended and it does not any longer allow for opting out and those provisions were removed. But so were the provisions that um, acknowledged the consensual and participatory and voluntary nature of customary law. And so it's that version that has now returned to the National Council of Provinces um, and has now gone back to the National Assembly after the National Council of Provinces made some minor 
uh, amendments. And so the National Assembly's Portfolio Committee um, is looking at that version of the bill and working towards finalizing that process. So that's kind of the, the long history of the bill. To speak very briefly then about the content of this version, as I've pointed out, it no longer provides for an opportunity for people to opt out. And this was um, something that rural communities were very clear was a necessary inclusion in the bill. The feeling was very much that people must be able to exercise an ability to choose whether or not they want to use these courts, um, as opposed to being required and coerced into using these courts. Uh, and really that also aligns with the voluntary nature of customary law and the idea that it's a system that people choose to opt into and, and that's where it gets its legitimacy. In addition, this version of the bill lays out various uh, sanctions um, and decisions that the traditional courts can take. And so they can deal with matters related to theft, as long as it doesn't pass the 15,000 rand threshold. They can deal with matters related to damage to property, assault that doesn't constitute previous bodily harm, criminal inuria, and then they can provide advice on a range of customary law practices, including ugutwala, um, customary marriage, uh, initiation, uh, as well as something that's termed customary law benefits. Um, and then there's a catch-all, which is basically that the courts can also deal with any other dispute that arises between community members. So really the, the kind of concern around the content of the bill currently is that it is significantly narrowed from that 2017 version. And the worry is that it doesn't fully align with customary law as it operates in communities. Thank you very much, Nolundi, uh, for, for that uh, history that you've just shared with us and also uh, reflecting on the contents of the current bill. Because I think it's very important for us to understand that what are the issues with regards to the bill so that uh, people are able to make up their, their, uh, their minds with regards to whether the bill will uh, uh, ensure justice or not um, uh, uh, for the people that are living in the former homelands. Yes, uh, now I will move to uh, uh, Connie. Um, Connie, you no longer taken us through the, the history and the contents of the new version of the bill. And uh, on another side, you work with um, uh, communities that will be affected by this bill if it is passed into law. Uh, what I would like to know from you, what has been the responses of the communities towards the bill? Do they feel it will strengthen their position in terms of accessing justice? Do they think it's necessary? Um, and then once you've reflected on that, I'd also like you to reflect on whether the, the communities were properly con consulted in the development of this appeal. Uh, thank you, over to you. Thank you, Nganyiso. And uh, thank you, Nolundi, for taking us through the, uh, the new version of the bill. So, yes, um, I was part of the reference group that was representing civil society together with um, Mam Sizani, the late Mam Sizani Ngobani of the Rural Women's Movement, um, Sis Nomboniso Gaza, who is an advocate of Katamari Law, and um, uh, Tusi Rapo, who is a member of a community of Bafokeng King Royal uh, Community in Rustenbeck and uh, Afra in, uh, in, in Peter Marisbeck. So we were four representatives of the civil society at the reference group, and we were, um, we were with traditional leaders who were outnumbering us and, uh, and, the, and the Department of Justice officials, and sometimes COPTA will visit. And yes, uh, like Nolundi have already said, there was a compromise, which was a better version from the the the, the later version that was uh, was 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 run down by five provinces in in 2012. And from the first introduction of this bill, this uh, the, the communities, the rural women, the the civil society has really uh, was not happy about and, and, and they objected to the version of the bills, which is going to apply to the home former former homeland, which is a home to 17 million um, people of South Africa, and uh, this version of the bill, the new one, 
we, we, we thought it's a compromise, it was launched, even though we were not even happy because we didn't see the final version, which went to parliament. But we, we said, okay, because it provided, so the minutes of that meeting was providing the, the consensual uh, aspects of the bill that we agreed with and those that we didn't agree with. And it is not explicit in, in, in the representation of women uh, in, in, in the council. Like it, if you are summoned as a, as a woman, it, is not, it doesn't say women can represent themselves. It's not clear on that. It, it, it counts on the mercy, so we have to depend on the mercy of that council or the traditional leader to, to have uh, this consciousness around the rights of women and around the, the right of women to represent themselves. And we know that customary, customarily, there's a bad practice of undermining women. Many women still can't have access to land on their own right. They, still, they have to have their married male uh, person or the, the son to, to, to access land. And many household, uh, intra-household challenges and struggles around gender are still not resolved. So we are not going to count on the mercy of uh, the institution. It should be explicitly written in the, uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the bill. And then the other thing is that when uh, Don Jeffrey was representing this bill for the first time in parliament, uh, when uh, uh, he told them that the bill is not going to be constitutional because of the opt-out laws. Now, without that opt-out laws, there is no balance in terms of the, the structural power relations that exist in our societies. And the, if, without opt-out and without a legal representation, um, which is the right in our constitutional, then, then there is no there's no balance. We just uh, we are just thrown into the pit. So our most fears is that the land issue, because we know that if the traditional leader can summon you to court and you have no right to opt out, they can they can easily say, okay, you didn't um, apply, so we are not gonna we 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 are gonna take your land rights away. We have many stories of women in KwaZulu Natal who are, are telling us that. The land was just taken from them when they are just at the production uh, production uh, level when they are supposed to when they use the land in their own projects. We got so many um, traditional leaders, female traditional uh, leaders who are who, who are just bullied by the other traditional leader next door for the for the mere fact that they are women. We've got so many bad practices, and it, and that is why we are gonna we're not gonna just depend on the mercy of an institution without a, a law. Now, your question around whether this is necessary. We know the history of traditional leadership. Uh, we know the, 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 the disputes that was lodged within SAPO Commission, which were unresolved. Right now, there's a petition going around, around the, uh, the Northwest people demanding that the Mafirica Commission must be released. And we don't know what is the reason for the Premier and the, the government of the Northwest not to release that Mafirica uh, Commission report. Uh, so we know that there's so many things there's, there's no so many disputes now we didn't vote for this in 1994 we we because of this disputes and this contradiction of this institution we voted for the alternative vision of democracy in south africa and as rural people we feel like we are being discriminated. We are being treated as subject of some some men or uh, some some sovereign uh, governance, uh, which are not belonging to South Africa. Because in South Africa, we've got the constitution of the country, which guarantees um, a, a, a equality, which a, a freedom of movement, and we cannot now be um, locked in. Um, a system of traditional governance which we not we are not uh, we are not affiliating or, or voluntarily affiliating ourselves to. We know that communities were built on on top of communities and land issue is involved in there. Therefore, we traditional leadership must be a consensual. It must it must be we must you must affiliate voluntary. You must feel like and it doesn't have. In fact, customary law doesn't have borders. So this is the fact that Sisnomboni have been trying to 
state. You can stay in Cape Town if you affiliate yourself to a, a certain community and a, a institutional, traditional institutional laws. It is a social contract that you make that this is me. This is I'm Mozana, I'm from Batum, and therefore I'll go by the rules. It doesn't matter where you live in terms of uh, boundaries. But now, if you are going to be locked into a system of, of governance where you don't feel like you will be treated uh, with justice, it is so, so unfair. Imagine one thing that was good about doing this uh, bill was to bring access to justice next to the people. Now, if you are going to bring access to justice next to the people, yet you don't have the appeals mechanism still say you must go to the higher level of traditional institutions. How how next how how near is justice then? Then it's not uh, happening. So the civil society and not I don't want to say the civil society because civil society is not homogeneous. But the communities which are going to be affected by this bill are saying no. If the representation of women is not explicit in the bill, we are saying no to the bill. If the issue of land and the the kind of sanctions that can be uh, uh, done by this. Um, by this by by this court is not it's not clear then we are saying no we cannot uh, we cannot be subjected to a traditional leader there's so many contradictions there's so many power imbalances imagine you are complaining about the traditional leader maybe you have a dispute uh, against the same traditional leader because look at such a community community the traditional leader just uh, decided to lock the people out of their fields and now where do you complain if now, because you are in this jurisdiction, you must face the same perpetrator to, to, to complain about your land rights issue. And when we know that land rights and land issues is a national issue. So there's so many uh, things about this bill and we, and we are saying uh, we, we cannot afford about that. We, we have tried, we have launched the Stop the Bantu Stand bills to say to the president, listen to us, listen to the version, our version of the story. And we have, uh, as the Alliance for Rural Democracy, we have had, we sent them seven bottom lines. One of them was that consultation, if there's going to be a traditional cause bill of any kind, it must start from the villages. So if we can ask for like the regulatory impact assessment to say, what are we trying to address here? What is the problem we are trying to address? The, Department of Justice is not giving us anything. Therefore, we are not able to say yes to this bill. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Connie, uh, for that reflection. Uh, maybe before I go back to Nolundi, um, I want just to understand something from you. Um, like uh, the communities, when they oppose to this uh, current version of the bill, is, it, is this opposition to the entire institution of traditional leadership or the traditional courts, or it's just a, 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 an opposition to the bill? So it is a, it's an opposition to the bill because this bill is a national bill. It is not uh, context specific. So I'm not going to be able to say it is, a, it is the overall consensus to the institution of traditional leaders, uh, leaders. Because we as the civil society have never said, we, we, we don't even have that right to say they, we, we, don't, we don't want the traditional, uh, institu the tra traditional leadership institution. It is there in the constitution of South Africa. So, but we are saying contexts are differing. You know, whatever people are experiencing in the villages of KwaZulu Natal, we cannot uh, wrap the whole country with one thing. And that is why we are saying it must be context specific. And if it's going to be a national bill, even those good ones who, who treated people okay, but because this is a law now, that is where, what we are opposing, that it cannot be a law which is a, a, a one size fits all. It must, um, it must be adjusted as according to to context. Thank you. Okay, no, thank you very much. Um, Melundi, um, Connie earlier on touched on the issue of uh, the stop of understand bills. And I know that uh, your organization has been part of that campaign. 
uh, we we saw demonstrations, we saw memorandums being uh, memoranda being submitted, letters being written to the president uh, to pro to protest the Bantustan bills, but uh, we are we still see them being pushed. And um, in 2019, late 2019, one of them was actually signed into law, which is um, the traditional and Coalition Leadership Act. And uh, now we have this bill. Uh, what I would like to ask from you, why is this happening? Um, uh, are politics at play? Uh, what's going on? So, Nganyi, so I think there's a lot going on, uh, and I think part of it is political, but I think there is also this question of mineral resources. Um, and so many of the communities that will be impacted by laws like the Traditional Courts Bill and the Traditional and Khoisan Leadership Bill are also the same communities that live on land that is very minerally rich. Um, and so what is a kind of an interesting connection to observe and an interesting um, underlying reality to see playing out is the fact that people who live uh, on these um, uh, on the land that has this mineral uh, wealth beneath it uh, are communities that have held these land rights for generations under systems of customary law. And what you see um, happening is that communities are being dispossessed effectively. Um, they're not being given adequate compensation when they have to be relocated. Um, and you're seeing that communities are not actually benefiting directly from the wealth that comes uh, from their land. And so what um, these laws set up is they facilitate through law um, the further kind of advancement of these processes of dispossession. And the way that they do that is that they all centralize a lot of the power, the decision making, the authority to enter into uh, agreements with um, you know, mining companies and other development forums on behalf of the community. They centralize that kind of power into the person of the traditional leader uh, and into the traditional council. And I think that, you know, as Connie's point about the fact that we cannot have laws that are one size fits all um, and that don't offer basic protection because we have to acknowledge that for some communities, their traditional leaders don't act in ways that are about advancing their interests or protecting their rights. Um, and there are you know, many examples, the Bakhatla Bakhafela, the Bapo, where you've seen immense mineral wealth just vanishing, disappearing into the pockets um, of a rising elite while communities remain you know, without information as to where all of that money has gone and with very little understanding as to who signed the contracts, who took the decisions, who is the person who authorized uh, the advancement of, of these mining projects and other forms of development. So really, I think that there is both a, a political and economic interest here, um, and it is playing out in a way that really um, disregards the land rights of customary um, communities and communities that live under systems of customary tenure, but it's also being facilitated and made possible by this network of laws that is absolutely determined to adopt a model and an understanding and an approach um, to customary law that is absolutely geared around the role of the traditional leader as the central authority, as the person who can make the decisions about people's land rights. Um, and in that process, you're undermining the agency of communities, but you're also undermining the fact that they are land rights holders, and these are decisions that must be theirs to take. So I, I certainly would say that I think there's both a political and economic um, element at play here, and that's what's influencing the context within which these laws are being passed. Mm. Okay, no, uh, thank you very much, uh, Nolundi. Uh, Connie, do you have any like um, uh, views with regards to maybe what do you think is going on with regards to these bills that we're seeing being pushed? Hello. So I thought oh, Sis Margaret from uh, the village of Mapila was going to come in, and that's why I wanted to cut because every time we uh, the voices that appear is us, and then it's a it's a very it's problematic that uh, we are not unmuting um, the rural voices, but I mean it's, it's a it's a political problem as well. So. The, the, at the heart of this bill is mineral wealth. So why we said stop the Bantustan bills is because it's it's a it's a matrix of bills. It's not one. 
So if you look at the traditional leadership and Khoisan bill, uh, 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 section 23 of it, and you look at the, the they wanted to amend the Communal Property Association Act, which um, which gives people an alternative governance uh, system if they are not happy, but they want to govern their land as a group. They also wanted to amend the, the Mining and Petroleum Development Act uh, to um, erode this uh, principle of consultation and uh, consent. And now we, the, the civil society, they, they, we have, um, we have a, a campaign of the right to say no because of uh, people have to be consulted about any development that is coming to their area and that uh, that act has section 54 where which which guides the processes of consultation and consent and what should happen what should be in place before any development comes in so before any mining comes uh, to operation agreements with the land rights holder and the mining rights holder must be in place. We need to know. So they they also pull in different departments inside there. The department, the police, they've got a role to play. The Department of Cooperative and Governor uh, uh, and Traditional Affairs, Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs. The the Department of Rural Development is a fence setter, and we don't know why because they they are the the custodian of, of of communal rights they are offensive that and now they want to come up with the communal land rights act which is going to give powers of outside outer boundaries to the traditional leader and give tenure security to people limited to their own residential areas but what's happening about com common property where where, where people are um, grazing and the rivers and everything it's going to be the traditional leader so if you look at all these bills you will see that they are strateg strategically and the corporates the department of justice the rural development the department of cooperative uh, and, 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 and and if it's the, the 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 local government because you don't you are you don't understand so there is one thing one thing is to make sure that traditional leadership has powers over land and they can take decisions without consulting and getting consent from the people and they can now if you have um uh, if you if you argue your rights as according to the interim protection of land rights act they can now summon you to this court and uh and and and, 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 and make you feel like you are guilty of something, and then they can make decisions about the land. So this is why we are saying this is the Bantu stand bills because if there were if there were laws that are going to be applicable to South Africa and to uplift the citizens of South Africa, why does it why does it have to apply to the former Bantu stands only, and why does it have to um, give traditional leaders power over land? And when the Minister of Land Affairs is the one who is supposed to a custodian of land up until chosen by the people, so that um, I don't know if we've lost Connie. Uh, Connie, are you still I'm here? Still oh, okay, okay. No, thank you very much, uh, Connie. Just to clarify to our viewers. Uh, we had invited Memo more, but unfortunately she's she's unable to join us because of connection problems. Um, Nolundi, before I go to our questions, um, uh, could you kindly um, explain to us uh, briefly the issue of uh, the opt-out clause that both of you have been reflecting on? What, what does it mean? Um, maybe if you can just frame it uh, with regards to the, 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 the laws that we have here in South Africa, the justice system that we have in, in South Africa, what does it mean and, and why is it important? Thanks. Sure. So the opt-out clause is effectively um, an ability and an opportunity for people to express a choice, right? Um, and so I think we all recognize that customary courts um, and traditional courts in these communities offer an alternative avenue to access justice. Um, and nobody is disputing that. But part of the uh, legitimacy of a customary law system is that people have the ability to affiliate. So as Connie was saying, people have the ability to say, I 
I am, you know, a member of this community. Um, I think that traditional leader so and so is somebody who, um, you know, I, I respect and someone that I am comfortable um, uh, uh, sort of uh, acknowledging and, um, uh, you know, recognizing as my traditional leader. And so that same principle, that principle of a voluntary choice to affiliate, um, a voluntary uh, decision to be part of the system, to abide by the rules, the practices, um, is an inherent part of customary law. And so when we speak about um, the opt-out, opt-in clause, we're talking about making sure that built into the law is the ability for people to make a choice, to say, actually, I don't feel that if I take this matter to a traditional court, um, I will be able to, to get a fair hearing or, you know, um, actually this matter um, has to do with the conduct of the traditional council and I don't feel that I will receive uh, a fair hearing. Um, and people then have the option to opt out, to not use that as an avenue for um, accessing justice and an avenue to take their matters. And for women in particular, the ability to exercise this choice uh, is critical because as Asconi has indicated, the experiences that rural women have um, of some of these forums is a place of you know, highly oppressive exclusion um, and the inability to voice their concerns. So when we're speaking about this opting out, opting in, we're talking about choice. We're talking about the fact that um, the constitution enshrines the right for people to live the cultural life of their choosing. And so an opt in uh, clause, a process by which people can exercise this choice would in our opinion, be in line with that constitutional value. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Nolundi, uh, for that. Now we will go to our uh, first uh, question or a comment from Tembi. Um, Tembi Chabalala, um, she comments, the bill in the current form. Okay, I think it's a question. Yes, it's a question. Um, does it violate the, the rights of rural women? Um, I will ask Connie to respond first, and then Nolundi will come in second. Thank you. So last week, I think last year, two weeks back or last week, we were in Limpopo uh, having our own uh, mobilization meeting uh, that we hold as the national, as, as the rural, um, the Alliance for Rural Democracy. And we had a women's group only. It was so, it was like a joke. So this woman was giving us her experiences around there's an echo i don't know is coming from so this woman was giving us um, her experiences around the traditional courts in her village and that's what uh, what i wanted margaret mulumu to come and speak about so apparently women are not allowed to represent their cases uh, uh, they need to, they need a male person who is not a lawyer, who's like maybe a family person to represent them. And what she was telling us is saying, in a case where there's no males like um, in, your, in your family, women can address the court, but they have to face that way. So they must give the court, they mustn't face the traditional authority, uh, the, the council, they must like never share an eye contact. They must look at the thing. So you, and I asked her, hey, when did this happen? He said, like in December 2020, and I was saying, are you for real? So it is not me. I'm not living in the traditional uh, authority. I'm, I'm working in Jobek, and I'm not going there every day. So it is, we, we, we cannot make noise about something that is not going to apply to us. Uh, it is the is the women's experiences that are telling us what's happening. So if you go to KwaZulu Natal, there's this mama called Mam Gadi who are telling us the way in this 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 mama is a if a strong activist who really stand up and fights for her rights. And if he tells you how many offices of Kokta did he knock in the rural development trying to assert her rights against the traditional leader, the, the institution. You ask yourself, what about those submissive women who find themselves in um, an environment which is hostile, where they have already accepted their faith that it is because they are women? What about them? If a woman like this can go to all avenues and still cannot uh, you know, uh, um, be recognized in her own right, a mama of uh, over eight years. So 
<laughs> it is not us, Tembi. It is the, the women there who are telling us their experiences. And even if I'm not living in the rural areas, I'm telling you that this is what is happening in my family. I, I hope they are listening to me because that's true. I can be an assertive Constance Mohale, but I had an experience at the funeral of my father, at the, any gathering that's happening at home. Men are supposed to take decisions. If they are not saying it should happen, it will not happen. So we know that it is happening even in our houses, uh, this thing of women being oppressed. So we cannot have it as a law. When we, our constitution guarantees our rights, uh, we have all these international laws like the Convention on Elimination of Discrimination of Women that our country have, is a signatory to, the Beijing Platform of Action, and uh, you know, let's leave that because we are international. The consensual nature of customary law. It, we cannot have laws today that want to erode all of those rights for women to, uh, you know, to, to, to take a stand and, and, and say what is justice for them. So this is what's happening. It is not, um, so maybe I, should, I, I shouldn't have said it is rural women who said that. We experience it every day in our daily lives. Okay, thank you very much, Connie. Now we'll go to our next uh, question, which is from Malin. Behind pushing for the regressive changes to the bill, and how were these able to win over the more progressive interpretation of custom expressed in the earlier version of the bill? I think uh, Nolundi will reflect on that, and then uh, Connie will also reflect because she was part of the reference uh, group that uh, 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 was part of the formulation of the, the other bills. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, and thanks to Malin for the question. Um, so the key thing here, Malin, is I think that when it comes to these laws relating to customary uh, law and customary rights, um, we're seeing a real shortcoming in Parliament's role. Uh, there is clearly a shortcoming in the legislative process because it was in Parliament, it was the Portfolio Committee, um, under the, the guidance of the former chairperson, uh, Dr. Matola Mochecha, that made the changes that were so regressive. Um, and the types of arguments that were being put forward for why these changes were necessary was, you know, this kind of idea that um, the bill as it was um, from the reference group process, you know, undermined the status of traditional leaders and undermined the status um, of these courts. And so to kind of restore the status of these courts, it was necessary um, to narrow the bill and to remove all of these important acknowledgements of consensual nature affiliation. So actually the power in this process, uh, Marlon, really lay with the portfolio committee to make drastic changes that um, takes the process backwards. And it's very unfortunate that it was the, the portfolio committee that acted in this way, because of course the whole point of the legislative process is that um, the portfolio committees, the committees who are, um, you know, uh, um, uh, 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 the lawmakers are part of those committees are supposed to take into account people's opinions, people's views, um, and to be guided by those responses. And it seems that the portfolio committee chose to act in a manner that just ignored people's concerns um, and that advanced changes that really seem to be moving from uh, support for a traditional leadership uh, lobby. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nolundi. Uh, Connie, at some stage you were part of the process. How did you lose? Um, mm. Yes, yes. Thank you. How did you lose? Because um, uh, uh, the, the question here it's about because we see here it's a it's a it's a, a a battle between the progressives and those who are not progressive. And you were part of the process. Maybe if you can reflect as to what ended up uh, with um, you as the progressives. Or us ending up with this bill, which uh, does not necessarily, uh, uh, which is not uh, progressive. Yes, thank you. So, Taniso, even before the process of the reference group, from like the way Nolundi has taken us through the history of this bill from 2008 to 2012, to uh, so 
we met in parliament from different parts of the country saying we cannot have a bill like this in the new democratic South Africa. People came from all angles with their submission in their own languages and uh, we, they, they said no to this bill. So we, so we were seen as people who are spoilers. Every time we say no to something that parliament introduces, and that's why the deputy minister John Jeffrey approached us and said, and said to us, let's come with a reference group, which is going to represent all angles of uh, the civil society and government, and come up with a bill that will be acceptable, that will be a compromise. And that is why the, that is how the reference group came into play. We were even hesitant to be in the reference group because if they we know that we are not in control of what will be presented at the parliament, and uh, we will be blamed to say we are opposing the bill that we took part in, in developing. But we went, we said, uh, we, we argued amongst ourselves and we said, let's just go because the next thing they will say, we invited you to come and give us your, your vision. We invited you and you didn't come. Remember, civil society is not funded by government. I don't know if there's any civil society that's getting grants from government. We traveled with our time. Nobody's compensating us. They don't even care where, what petrol we use. We traveled to Pretoria almost every week for the reference group. And yet we, we felt that there was something wrong because there was meeting caucuses, secret caucuses with traditional leaders that excluded us. But in, in any case, we just went. We just went with the flow and we, we reached a compromise and we felt like this bill is now ready to present to parliament. Now, the first, so I, I like it because the parliament has videos, you know, there's evidence. The first time the deputy minister presented this to parliament, there was a pushback from Matolio Motecha. You understand, one man who's taking uh, his mandate from somebody, I don't know, and saying, you can't do this, you can't do that. We, we had traditional leaders in the reference group who are very influential in the country. Because, you know, there are traditional leaders who are just traditional leaders. They are not regarded by, as nothing by parliament. Because we have traditional leaders who support our stance as well, who are very progressive. So, so, we, so, so, so things get spoiled at parliament. The, the bill was now uh, edited and some versions of which are progressive were taken down. So now it means our investment, our time investment going to Pretoria was nothing. So we immediately launched um, the Stop the Bantu Stand bills. We, we were stressing each other about resources, how are we, we cannot represent rural communities, though it's therefore it means rural communities must be transported to Pretoria to tell the president that have mercy on us. We cannot have bills like this. This is what we did. But still, this bill is still there, and now it's in cabinet. So the, the rural people of South Africa in our meetings are saying we have lost confidence in the policy-making processes of South Africa because our participation means nothing. So I mean, really, in the in the in the in the early days of democracy, people used to do things in parliament without any anything, and people were happy because they thought it is our government. We voted for it, and it's okay. But now, in the uh, modern days of technology, people can see what's happening in parliament. So they must stop saying that we are listening to the academic voice, we are listening to the, the, the unprogressive white voices, because it is really an insult to us. What does it mean to say to me, or well, everything that I'm saying, I'm, I was told by, by Nolundi or by some academic person, or, and how, what, what do you take me for? There, there are people in, in the rural areas who are watching at this show right now. So with the, the advantage, people can see what is happening. You cannot betray them anymore. So they can see that these people who are our legislatures in provinces who voted for this bill in parliament, if you can ask them, so next time you do this show, please get, get the nation, the legislatures to come and tell us why did they vote for this bill. Some of them don't, don't even know the contents. They were told that the caucus, you must go and vote for this. Because I addressed the legislature of Northwest. I even went to the ANC caucus. And 
they said to me, we didn't even know what is in this thing. And I told them, guys, this is regressive. It cannot be. But still they voted for the deal. So who are they thinking they are betraying? They are only betraying themselves because now they cannot betray the people anymore. People are saying we've lost confidence. Even when there's this public hearings now, now with COVID, they have to be on the online. People are saying, why do you even bother to take us and give us data to participate? Because these people will do what they want anyway. The outcome is always disappointing. Even after our efforts to travel to Cape Town, to travel to where the public hearings are, still, we still get this result. So probably the ANC need to say, who are they accounting to? Whose interest are they representing in parliament? Because we feel we are not represented. Thank you. Oh, uh, thank you very much, Ikoni. Hey, that's a very hard-hitting comment. Um, and now we will go to our next uh, question from David. Um, David says, disputes between a community member and their headmen are very common in rural communities. While the traditional courts have jurisdiction over disputes between headmen and a community member. Uh, Nolundi kindly responds to that. So on a reading of the bill as it stands, uh, the bill requires that where the traditional leader is uh, a party to the dispute or you know, their fam family members involved in the dispute, they have to recuse themselves. So the idea is that uh, they wouldn't be able to preside over the dispute, but uh, there's nothing in the bill that would prevent um, a community member who has a dispute with their uh, traditional leader from taking that to the traditional court. Um, and of course, the idea then would be that the traditional leader um, has asked somebody else to preside over that matter in their absence. Now, you know, whether or not that's going to um, result in a fair hearing, whether or not um, the person who is appointed is going to feel that they would have the authority to make a decision that perhaps goes against the traditional leader, goes against the headman, is a whole other question. Um, but technically, yes, a person should be able to take their traditional leader to the court. Um, the traditional leader wouldn't be able to preside over that matter. They'd have to step aside and somebody else would preside. But whether or not you're going to get um, a fair balance uh, of power playing out in those forums is a whole other question. Okay, thank you very much, Nolundi. Um, I would like to follow up on what you've just said. Uh, are there like enough mechanisms to ensure that that happens? that when there are such disputes, they are able to recuse themselves? So at this point, Gangi, so it's not really clear um, whether or not there's going to be adequate monitoring of whether these so-called protections actually happen in practice. Um, the bill does provide a role for a justice of the peace um, who would be somebody who is legally trained, but really that person uh, only has a role when it comes to assisting a community member um, to potentially take their case to another forum, a high court or a magistrate's court. Um, and so at this point, there is actually no clear mechanism for fully monitoring whether or not uh, traditional courts actually abide by what's in the bill at this point. Um, so there wouldn't be a way of actually knowing for sure whether the traditional leader did recuse themselves and whether uh, the person that they appointed was somebody who could be objective in that particular um, circumstance. So, you know, the bill does this thing really of defaulting to relying on a traditional leader doing the right thing, rather than putting in place robust protections um, that would protect people when a traditional leader doesn't do the right thing. So right now, it's basically relying on the grace of the traditional leader being decent enough to say, okay, this is what I'm supposed to do, and actually doing that, which I would argue is not sufficient protection at all. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Nolundi. We will go to our next question. Um, is from Sharon. Uh, the question is, who presides over the traditional courts? Are they the residents of the community? Are they require, or required to understand the customs? Connie? 
According to the Traditional Leadership and Governance Framework Act of 2003, as amended, is that there should be a tra a transitional requirements from tribal authorities to the traditional council. Now, we assume that the traditional council is the one who is supposed to preside, but the presiding officer is the traditional leader, of course. But then the traditional council have to have elections. They, they are elected and they have to have a composition of 40% from the community, 60% uh, appointed by the royal uh, family or council, and then 30% of the whole structure should be women. And these people, um, uh, well, the, in their hearts, the, the traditional leader herself has to uh, preside. Now, the problem also, especially in Limpopo, in the Northwest, most of the traditional councils have never went to the elections. So we don't know who's going to preside because um, the reason why this act was amended again and again was to extend because they were given five years in 2003 and in 2009 they didn't go for election and there was an extension. And then in that extension, they gave the minister the power or the minister or the premier the power to support uh, the, tri the tribal authority in processes and logistics to make sure that this happened. The, those powers were never used and then there was an extension. So there was a time, I think three, four years back, Nodundi can remind me, where we were debating the traditional leadership and question uh, bill, which was going to replace this act. And we were saying to them, they, at the same time we were, we were discussing the amendment. And we were saying now what comes first what, what what's what's happening because this act uh, the question uh, leadership act is going to replace all the other traditional uh, laws that are governing traditional institutions now why are we amending it the reason they were amending it was because these people don't want to go for elections so probably we are still dealing with tribal authorities which were composed as according to the black authorities act and that is the problem because the Black Authorities Act was designed to exclude women in particular, was designed to exclude black people from development. It was designed to, to, to have our own borders, traditional leaders, as opposed to the, 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 the traditional leaders which were born for, for that room. So that's the problem. So that, that question is more relevant to our argument as to who is going to preside. And at what cost? Because there's another thing of logistics and uh, budget. So they're gonna pass the bill, but who, what, who? I mean, the, who's the preside? The, 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 was the appeals mechanism. They need a competent justice person who can document the law, the, the the proceedings, and say this is what happened, this is what went wrong. If you appeal a case with a a, a mama who my aunt who's, who's often helping in, in taking minutes at the village how how are they going to be you know outstanding at the court for you to get justice so there's a, there's so many questions that you can ask that how 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 practical are you guys gonna do you're gonna give our faith uh, uh, our access to justice to an institution that is not competent uh, which doesn't meet the requirements just according to the constitution so there's a lot of arguments. Oh, oh thank you very much. Uh, maybe before we wrap up, I would like to ask um, the issue of like the meeting the composition requirements for traditional councils, and also the issue of elections ha has been raised for a number of years. Why why is it not happening? What is stopping it? Um, and Nolundi? So Connie is, is absolutely right, Nganyi. So the one part is that they do keep amending the timelines um, to allow these councils to finally abide um, by the requirements uh, in the law. Um, but it is, uh, you know, both partly, as, as, as Connie points out, um, a disregard on the part of the councils uh, to this requirement. Um, but in addition to that, you know, it seems that there are capacity issues uh, with the IEC and their ability to support um, the running of these elections. Uh, and so really, it would seem that nobody is monitoring this. And this is the realm. This is the point, as Connie was, was 
making earlier, this is the realm of COCTA, right? This should be the Cooperative uh, Governance and Traditional Affairs Department who is keeping an eye on this and making sure that these elections are happening as they are required to. But there just is no follow-up, it would seem. And rather than, you know, saying to traditional councils that haven't complied, this is the deadline, either you meet the deadline or there are consequences, the state just keeps extending and extending and extending. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nolundi. Um, it is clear that there are delays uh, or, or unwillingness to um, uh, meet the composition requirements and also to hold uh, elections. Baby Connie, just to ask you, like on the action part, what needs to be done? Uh, because it sounds like uh, if nothing is done, this will continue uh, for a number of years, whereas the very same uh, 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 traditional councils that are, are given these tasks, administering justice and all that, um, uh, will be uh, 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 around. So, Connie, could you kindly uh, um, maybe suggest like what needs to happen in order to make sure that um, they hold elections, they also meet these composition requirements? Mm. So what needs to happen? I think uh, this is, uh, um, I'll, I'll give a multi-layered answer because all of us, whether you are in government, whether you are in the civil society and the community agency itself has to show up. So what needs to happen? I mean, we uh, currently we have uh, instructed our, our lawyers to take the this this thing um, and give us legal advice and if if it, if it comes to a push we must take it to court with uh together with the traditional and cohesion leadership act which is in the process of going to court and which is coming into effect today really we're debating this and there's a traditional this cohesion bill is coming into effect today so it is a court uh, we, we give ourselves um um but we shouldn't give up our own agency. And uh, for the communities who are listening today, we need to have a defiance uh, campaign. We need to defy these guys. If they call you, resist. You know, we must resist. We come with a resistance campaign. We must defy them. And even where we were, li we like them because we the governance in rural areas is under traditional authorities and. If traditional authorities are not going to listen to us, they are they want to be dictated by a certain act from parliament as to how they govern their own uh, uh, territory. Then we want to defy them because we know that they are taking they are taking instructions from parliament. They're getting salaries. People must show their own agency. We cannot always blame lawyers for not uh, taking our, our our cases to court because. Once the government has, uh, the court has ruled, we've got so many cases that are similar that we won the cases. But what is happening on the ground? Business still goes on as usual. And that is why the people's agency, people must mobilize, people must fight this, this thing. This bill must be scrapped. To parliament, we're saying to them, they must scrap this bill. If they want to still see them, enjoying our votes and whatever, they must grab this bill. I've asked the question earlier, who are they accounting to? Whose mandate are they representing in parliament? If it is our mandate, then they shouldn't, shouldn't have voted for this bill. So we are not going to sit down and then, and, and, you know, during COVID, everybody was in lockdown and people are, are making decisions in parliament and pushing bills in. We are not going to sit down because this is our fate. If you take my grandmother's land and telling me that I must come to some court to, for, for it to tell me that they, I cannot plant there because there's a mine coming to operate. So you go home, hope you find your livestock locked in the crawl because there is a, a prospecting happening in the grazing camp and, and, and livestock is terrorized. That is all, guys. We cannot avoid it. If it's all, let's face it. So, this, I mean, this is my feeling as con, and by this, I hope our communities are listening. No messiah is going to come from Cape Town to save you. We need to support your initiative as a community. You are already resisting. So when Tina, we are coming to reinforce what is already there. 
we will never give up. We will never give up our agency. We will fight. We defeated apartheid. We will defeat this government if it still treats us the government. I want to quote the Nelson Mandela when he said, if you feel like the ANC government is treating you like the apartheid government, do unto them as you did to apartheid government. And this is what we need to do. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Connie. Uh, Nolundi, any closing remarks before we end the webinar? Just to say, Gangi, so you know that I think uh, as Connie's statement is, is incredibly powerful. Um, and for people who don't, you know, live in rural communities, who don't, who wonder why these issues matter, why are these uh, bills something that people should care about? To say that, you know, ultimately, I think these bills are a threat to the idea of one South African citizenship. We already know the levels of inequality across the country um, in a range of different, uh, you know, spaces: economic inequalities, uh, access to resource inequalities. And if we are going to uh, submit and allow these um, laws to pass, we're effectively allowing and endorsing an inequality of citizenship for some people in our country to be, you know, um, subjected to a different system of law, to be classed as secondary citizens. Um, and effectively, we would be betraying this idea that this is one South Africa where everybody should have an equal experience of what it is to be a citizen. Um, and so, you know, for that, I would say that people who live in other parts of uh, the country too should be worried about these laws and should be interested in what's happening. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nolundi and Constance, and also to our audience. Uh, please uh, do join us again next week, uh, same time, for our webinar, which will be looking at the implications of COVID-19 on the food systems in Southern Africa. Uh, we are going to be sending out um, uh, adverts. Please uh, do join us again next week. Uh, thank you very much, and goodbye.